In the first section of this chapter, we saw that after a period of time, chemical reaction systems come to a situation where the concentrations of reactants and products appear to be unchanging with time. And this is true of all reaction systems, even those that go all the way to products, essentially. But there's more to the story. And one of the most fascinating observations of systems in equilibrium is that the concentrations of reactants and products follow mathematical patterns. That's the case, for example, in the reaction of N2O4 to form two NO2 molecules that we've been looking at so far. These concentrations at equilibrium are not entirely random. And in fact, regardless of the initial amount of N2O4 we start with, or regardless of whether we start with a mixture of NO2 and N2O4, the equilibrium state we end up with is characterized by a particular ratio of the products and reactants that doesn't depend on the initial conditions. The value of this ratio and the form of the ratio are known as the equilibrium constant or reaction quotient. We're gonna introduce these concepts here in this video and see how they're useful for thinking about chemical systems in equilibrium. So first, let's introduce this idea of the reaction quotient, because the reaction quotient is entirely general for a system in equilibrium, non-equilibrium, any chemical reaction system. We can look at absolutely any flask, whether it's at equilibrium or not, and get an idea of the reaction quotient. Let's imagine that we had a hypothetical reaction with two reactants, A and B, with stoichiometric coefficients, little a and little b, and those reactants are being converted to products little c molecules of c and little d molecules of d. And actually here I'm showing a forward arrow only, but we can think about the reaction quotient in the context of reversible reactions, and most commonly we do in this context of reversible reactions. So let's make that a reversible reaction arrow. We denote the reaction quotient with the letter Q, and this is a ratio, as suggested by the word quotient, of product to reactant concentrations with a very specific form. We take the product concentrations in the numerator and raise each to the power of its corresponding stoichiometric coefficient, c to the power of c and d to the power of d, for example here. In the denominator, we have the concentrations of the reactants raised to their respective stoichiometric coefficients concentration of A raised to the A power times the concentration of B raised to the little b power. And this is the value of Q. And we can calculate, measure, what have you, that ratio for absolutely any chemical reaction system, be it in equilibrium or not. Absolutely any flask, any sealed vessel in which a reaction is occurring, provided we can get values for all four of these concentrations, we can calculate a value for the reaction quotient Q. Now, a couple of things about this. One thing about units. It looks like Q should have units as long as A plus B is not equal to C plus D. In other words, as long as the stoichiometric coefficients are not, for example, one to one to one to one, in which case all the units would divide out. If we have more concentration terms in the numerator versus the denominator or vice versa, we would expect Q to have some concentration units. However, for reasons that I won't get into, each term in brackets that looks like a molarity is actually a ratio of a molarity, molarity to a standard concentration, one mole per liter. And the upshot of this is that Q ends up being unitless. We're wor working just with molarity in terms of numbers rather than with, uh, uh, with units. This will also make our life easier as we start to use the reaction quotient and calculations later with the equilibrium constant. It's also true that concentration is not the only quantity that can be used in reaction quotients. In reactions of gases, it's often more convenient and perfectly okay to use pressure instead. Thanks to the ideal gas law, the partial pressure of a gas is proportional to its concentration in a reaction mixture. That's actually worth reviewing if it's an idea that's unfamiliar to you. And so we can define the pressure-based reaction quotient, Q sub P, using partial pressures of A, B, C, and D rather than concentrations. And here again, rather than the pressures per se, this is really the pressure divided by a standard partial pressure of one atmosphere, for example. But the basic form is exactly the same. Partial pressure of C raised to the power of C times the partial pressure of D raised to the power of D. 
divided by the partial pressure of A raised to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient times the partial pressure of B raised to its stoichiometric coefficient. So in both cases, and in, in all reaction quotients, by definition, the basic form has product concentrations or some other measure that is directly proportional to concentration, and reactant concentrations in the denominator, products over reactants. An idea that you'll get very familiar with as you write the forms of and apply in calculations reaction quotients many times throughout this chapter and the ones that follow. In this practice problem, we're asked to write the concentration-based reactant quotient expressions for each of the following reactions. And all three of these involve only gases. We are going to throw a wrench in this a little bit when we talk about phase of matter and how that plays into writing reaction quotient expressions. But for now, we're dealing entirely with gaseous reactions. And remember the general idea here. I'm actually going to copy it from the previous slide just to remind us that the basic form of a reaction quotient has product concentrations in the numerator raised to their stoichiometric coefficients and reactant concentrations in the denominator raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. So here, for example, in the first case in A, we have two molecules of O3 on the product side and we have three molecules of O2 on the reactant side. And so the form of Q is going to be the concentration or more specifically the molarity of O3 squared. And in the denominator, we're going to have the concentration of O2 to the third power since the stoichiometric coefficient of O2 is three in the balanced chemical equation. And that's it, we're done. Let's move on to B. So in B, we have just one product, two molecules of N3, and we have two reactants, one molecule of N2 and three molecules of H2. And so the numerator will look similar to the first problem. We're gonna have NH3's molarity there, but squared because of the coefficient of two in the balanced chemical equation. And in the denominator, to handle multiple reactants, we're going to have multiple terms in the denominator that are multiplied. So we have, for example, one N2, so we're gonna have just an N2 molarity term there and we're gonna have an H2 molarity term to the third power because of the three in the balanced chemical equation. Finally, in the last case, we've got two reactants and two products, and it looks complicated, but it's not really as complicated as it looks as long as you know what to look for. Four NO2s and six H2Os are the products, and the reactants are four NH3s and seven O2s. And so on the whole, we're gonna end up with an NO2 concentration term to the fourth power and an H2O concentration term to the sixth power in the numerator. And in the denominator, we're gonna have, again, two terms, one for the ammonia in H3 raised to the fourth power and O2 raised to the seventh power. So each of these is a concentration-based reaction quotient expression we can concisely represent them with the letter Q, and we can calculate these for reaction systems involving these reactions in an equilibrium or non-equilibrium state. Hugely important quantity for the mathematical treatment of chemical equilibrium, as we'll see over the coming sections.